Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you please bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for mothers on this day. And uh, we also, of course, thank you that you still come to us on each and every day, but especially on these days of worship. And we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. You give me the words to say that I would preach faithfully. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day once again. It is good to be able to gather together. I did see someone posted on Facebook. Uh, you want to give your mother a Mother's Day gift, go to church and actually sit next to her. That was one of the suggestions to do. And I could even add to it, go to church and not act up. That'd be a nice thing. Um, <laughs> So there's lots of nice things that we can do for mothers. Oftentimes we think about these kind of, you know, dinners and, and kind of those types of things. But sometimes a really nice thing can be just how we behave and, and the things that we say to her and things like that. But we're going to be talking a little bit about Mother's Day and a little bit about some of the things that moms do for us, especially one of the biggest things moms do and fathers do as well, but is passing on the faith, passing on the faith to the children. And it's such a big deal. It's such an important thing. And we're going to be taking a look at a passage that talks a bit about this and uh, talking about that. So this is a 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. As I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears. As I long to see you, that you may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. A faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So here we have Timothy and Paul. Paul is writing a letter to Timothy, whom he calls uh, at one point his child of faith because he had proclaimed the gospel to Timothy and Timothy had come to faith through that. Timothy also traveled with Paul. He had traveled around with Paul on one of his missionary journeys. He served Paul as an emissary or a representative to some of the churches. And then he also eventually becomes a pastor in the Ephesus area. These are all these great things that Timothy has done. And yet Timothy, we also know, is young. He's a young man. When we start, or in uh, 1 Timothy, Paul even says, don't let them dis- dis- dismiss you because of your youth. Right? You have the word of God. You need to be uh, sure of that. And so we know that he's a young man, and yet he's doing all of these things. He might have just been you know, 18, 19 years old when all this started. And now we contrast that, though, today with a picture of the youth that we have in our churches and at times, it can look kind of bleak. I was looking at a, a survey that was done uh, two years ago that said that of um, young adults that had been attending church regularly, and they defined that of at least a year of going uh, two to three times a month, um, 66% stopped going to church during the ages of 18 and 22. 66% of them stopped going, and they gave lots of different reasons as to why, uh, but it's kind of a startling, a startling thing to consider. I mean, one of the reasons that we raise our children in the faith is because we want them to continue in the faith. And I even remember a story my parents shared with me when I went off to college. I went to Georgia Southern University, and while I was there, we were doing the orientation thing, right? We went up there for a weekend, and they split us up at one point and all the kids went off and they they were telling us all about the campus and all these great things and then they had the parents and the parents had their presentation and i remember y'all telling me 
um, when we got back together, that one of the things that they told the parents was, while your child is here, your child is going to question all the things that you taught them growing up, and they may choose their own paths and do their own thing, and you should encourage this. And their thought was, why? <laughs> I raised them with these, these uh, beliefs and you know, these ideologies because we think that they're good and they're right. Why would I then say, no, go run off and do something different? No, we raise them because we want them to continue in the faith. We want them to continue to, to know and to love Jesus Christ. And so how can we have more Timothys and less that are, well, I'm 18, I'm not under the, the roof of my parents, I'm done with church. How can we do that? So let's look at this passage, because it tells us a little bit about that, as well as some other passages that we, that we have to look at. So to start off, who does Paul credit with Timothy's faith? Right, who does he credit? Well, first, he actually credits kind of three people. First, he credits God, first and foremost. God is the author of faith, and we know this from many of Paul's writing, but he calls it a gift from God. So first and foremost, it's God. And then he kind of takes a little bit of credit himself because he's, you know, I, I preach the gospel to you. But then who does he point to? He points to grandma and mom, right? To Lois and Eunice, Timothy's grandmother and mother, two women of faith. By two women of faith, he says, you know, it started with Lois, and she had faith, and she taught that to, to uh, Eunice, and then Eunice taught that to Timothy, and it passed down generation to generation. Now, of course, for them, it started as what? It started as faith of Jehovah and the coming Messiah. You know, when, when Lois is around, that's before Jesus, right? Timothy would have been born probably, or definitely, while Jesus was here, but he may not have understood what was going on and all that. It wasn't until uh, later that he receives faith. We know that uh, from Acts. But so we see that, he, that he's crediting the faith of grandma and mom, passing faith down one generation to the next, and that's a big deal. Notice it doesn't mention dad, which is kind of an interesting thing. You would expect that dad would have been uh, mentioned here, but he's not, and we're not quite sure uh, but we do know from Acts 16 that his father was Greek. So it's kind of a, an unusual situation of the day, would have uh, possibly caused some problems. But in Acts 16, 1 to 3, it says, Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra, um, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers of Lystra and Iconium. And so here we have dad is just simply described as a Greek, which is a little bit unusual, you know, because the, the Jewish people really weren't supposed to intermarry with uh, non-Jewish people. In fact, in, in some groups, they shouldn't even go outside of the tribe, let alone to go marry a Greek. Now, this has caused some people to think, well, dad was not a believer. He would have been a pagan or something. I don't know. Um, you know, it doesn't tell us here. I kind of wonder if you have... This, this woman, Eunice, who is described as, as having this great faith, would she marry a non-believer? You know, outside of some situation of force? Would, would mom, would Lois have allowed her daughter to do that? So we know that there were people who were Greeks who still believed in God. We see this also in Acts uh, with Cornelius. He believed in God, but he was still a Greek. Uh, but we do know that his father never uh, became Jewish, what they would call a proselyte. So he never went through the process to become Jewish. And because of that, then uh, Timothy is never circumcised and, and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, how that might have affected him. But let's go back to Lois and Eunice and this passing on, right? This is a story of the passing on of faith from generation to generation and learning about it. And so they took seriously that reading that we had earlier today, which they would have known from Deuteronomy. Right? In Deuteronomy, it tells parents, teach this to your children. Right? Be diligent about teaching the instructions of the Lord to your children. And how do they describe it? Do it when you're sitting down, when you're walking on the way, when you're, when you're coming home, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up, pretty much all the time. Right? This isn't just a, hey, I brought them to church on Sunday, I've done my thing. It's, this is a lifestyle. 
This is something that we teach every single day, that we, we raise them in the faith. And it's interesting that the, the onus of doing that, the responsibility of that is put on the, on the parents, right? It's not put on the church. It's not put on the synagogues. Now, of course, they were still a part of that. The church, the synagogues, they were, they're a part of that. They're there to help the parents to be able to do that and kind of work together. But you have to work together. And ultimately, as parents, we need to be raising our children in the faith. We need to be teaching them. And so we see them doing this. They taught the scriptures to Timothy. Lois and Eunice did. In fact, in uh, a few chapters later in chapter 3, it says this. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Because all scripture is God, or is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So we know that he was raised being taught the scriptures. And this, as we look back at dad, this might be an indication of one of the struggles that they may have endured because that whole marrying a Greek thing was, was really not looked well upon. And in fact, if, depending on the group they were in, if they paid attention to another law from Deuteronomy that said no one born of a forbidden marriage or their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, it may be that Timothy wasn't even welcome in the synagogues to be taught. And so rather than mom saying, oh, well, if we can't take him to the synagogues, then what else do we do? They, mom and grandma said, we're going to teach him. We'll teach him ourselves. Whether they were allowed, that's a little speculation there, but whether they were allowed into the synagogues or not, they definitely took it upon themselves to teach the scriptures. And they were trusting in them. You know, as Paul says, the scriptures are effective, right? They are God-breathed, and they do something to us. And so it's not just about teaching, like we teach math. It's about exposing our children to the word of God, which then affects them. We may feel a lot of times like we... Who am I? Who am I to do this? I don't, know, I don't know a lot of these passages. I don't understand a lot of these things. And we may feel like we aren't able to do that. But you know what? That's okay. Because God's the one who works through it. When we read the scriptures with our kids, we are trusting in that promise that we have here in this, this passage that God works through his scriptures. They are God-breathed and they will, they will affect us. They will affect our children as we read to them. So it teaches, it tells us about sharing that gospel, about sharing the scriptures with the kids and how important that is to raise him in that and raising him in the faith. And of course, that still is true today. That still is true today. So coming back to the youth of today, what can we do? Well, why did they leave? You know, I mentioned there were a lot of different reasons they're given. I'll t- tell you the top five here that were given for, for the issues today. One was moving to college, which I guess a disruption of the normal, what you're used to doing. Uh, second, church members seem judgmental or hypocritical, right? Well, that's not good. Um, third, I didn't feel connected to the people in my church. Fourth, I disagreed with the church's stance on political social issues. Um, and that one was actually pretty low. It was only about like 22%. And then the last one was I had work or something else that prevented me from attending, which I kind of thought was a little bit of a, a cheat because their, their service is now on Saturdays and all different kinds of times and, or online. So <laughs> there's lots of different options out there. But there are reasons, you know, that people dropped out. Nearly two-thirds of people. Now, the, the good news is that a lot came back. A lot come back, but there are still many who don't. So what about the other people? Though, What about the, the young adults who stay? What were, were some of the things that they found were commonalities with them? And first and foremost, uh, they said that Jesus, uh, their relationship with Jesus was personal as well as communal. So in other words, they saw a direct relationship. Like, I, I know Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Jesus is relevant to my life. 
They saw that they understood that. They also uh, saw it as a communal thing. And so it was important for them to have uh, meaningful relationships with people within the church. And they felt like they belonged there. They also saw themselves as countercultural. Right? In other words, I'm not figuring out what I believe and what I think about topics by what the culture is telling me, but rather by the word of God. And that I can actually then bring that to people to bring the word of God to people. They saw that as part of their role. And those were kind of the big things. I was disappointed because they apparently did not ask about parents in this, which I thought that I would love to see that. I would suspect that one of the commonalities that you would find is that you have parents who were actively involved in their faith life and showing that to their children and involved in the church and showing that to their kids. So what are some of the things that we can do as we think about passing on the faith to our kids, and having more Timothys, if you will, than those who are leaving the church. Well, first and foremost, I would say we do what Lois and Eunice did, right? Teach the scriptures to our kids. Sit down and read with our children. Age appropriate, you know, so when I'm sitting with my four-year-old, I'm probably not just going to pull out Leviticus and start (laughs) reading that to him. He he, he will fly over his head. Um, I don't even know if I would do that with you, Kaylee. That might be even a little challenging at, at 12. But uh, it's, you know, reading the, the there are Bible stories for the younger. There are, uh, you know, just sitting down and reading as they get older, just sitting and reading through the books. Let's just open up Mark and just start reading through it and talking about it. You know, taking a little time to do that. So teaching the scriptures. And you don't have to know everything about it. That's okay. But you can also find out. Right? As I was thinking about this, as I was preparing for this week, I was reminded of, if you've seen Incredibles 2, y'all have seen Incredibles 2, right? It's a cool movie. Well, there's this one scene where, you know, dad is having to deal with all the home stuff while mom is out being superhero. That's kind of the, the thing of the movie. And I hope I'm not, if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, spoilers. Uh, <laughs> But there's this one scene where dad is trying to help uh, his son with math, and he had sat down with him to do the math with him, and the son was learning some new math that was different from the way dad had been taught the math. And so he's like, like, I don't understand this. This doesn't make any sense to me. And he's just frustrated. And for a while there, he's just like, you're on your own, kid. Try to figure it out. I don't know how to help you. And then as the you know, they come, come to that story turn where now things are starting to shift for him. He's, he decides one night he's going to help him. And so he stays up all night studying this math and learning how to do it so the next morning he could sit down with his son and say, okay, I know how to do this now. Let's do this. You know, I was kind of I was reminded of that thing. What are all the things that we do for our kids where we just go above and beyond? But do we do that if we like come across a passage? We're like, I don't know what that means. Well, maybe we can do a bit like Mr. Incredible there and let's figure it out. Do a little research, figure it out. But don't let your, your feeling like, I don't know everything about this stop you. Just discover together. That's one of the cool things too. It's, you know, they're learning too. It's okay to see that, that you're learning as well and discover that. That can be a great bonding experience. Uh, second, so teach the scriptures. Second, pray. I have no doubt that, that Lois and Eunice were praying for little Timothy and older Timothy as he went out. Pray. God promises to hear our prayers, to answer them. Uh, So be praying for them. Uh, Also, no doubt, these women, as described of being, uh, having great faith, lived out their faith in front of their kids. You know? And I think we're, a lot of times, what we do pretty good with this. We may, uh, you know, be engaging in things as parents or around our kids, going to Bible studies or, or church or, or reading the Bible, but sometimes we kind of separate them on certain things. Go, well, they don't need to be exposed to this, and, and not like, you know, diff, you know, terrible things, but even like, I'm trying to make a financial decision. How do I do this? Well, if we never bring them into things like that, when they get to where they're dealing with that, how do they know how to deal with it? Right? So bring them in, even to some of those adult uh, situations that we may not always uh, bring our kids into and say, you know, hey, here's something that we're dealing with. I want you to see how we deal with this. Maybe we can even talk about how should we deal with this. And then they start to learn, especially as you pray over these things and, and understand what the scriptures say to them, that 
God is involved in all aspects of life. And that then teaches them some of those things that we saw in those, uh, you know, with the kids that stuck around, right? That, it's pers- that their faith is personal, that it's something that involves every aspect of our lives, that we can be countercultural. We can say, you know, I know this is what the culture says, but this is what God's word says. And so we believe what God's word says, not what culture says. And so they can be growing and learning those things through you and from you. Lastly, I would say it's important to, to provide those relationships outside of the family, hopefully within a church, uh, where they can see it also. You know, it's not just, well, mom and dad do this. But they can see there are, actually there's other people. You know, there, there are other adults. There are other young adults that actually believe in Jesus and see how relevant he is to life and, and how important Christ is to life. And so as we kind of come together and we have those relationships ourselves, we bring our kids into those relationships so they can see other people doing that, uh, that's a big deal. You know, that addresses one of those things that we see in the survey. You may say, well, that wasn't in the scriptures, but if you think about it, in that Acts passage where it talks about Paul coming to Derby and there was this guy, Timothy, right? What does it say? It says that he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Well, you're not going to be well spoken of if you don't know them, if you don't actually have relationships with these people. And so you can see just built into that, that there was community and he was involved in that community. So we can do that. So I would say those are kind of the big things, right? Teaching the scriptures, going over, reading the scriptures with our kids, pray for them, uh, show them how the faith lives out in life, and then bring them into a community of faith where they can actually have relationships with other people and see how important it is for them. But I want to leave you with this because I know that's, that's probably a lot, and it's, moms may be going, well, that's a lot that you just put on me. Thanks. <laughs> But God gives us promises too. And I want to leave you with the promises. God has given us mothers for a reason. He could have just had us spring forth from eggs or something and not had parents. We see animals that do that. But he gave us parents, parents that love us, parents that raise us, that teach us. Moms are a blessing. Moms are a blessing to our children. They're a blessing to husbands too, quite frankly. And you get to be a blessing also to your children, right? God works through you to do work in your kids. How amazing is that? That God says, I'm not just going to work outside of of this. I'm going to work through you. That's why he has the parents teaching the children, because he desires to work through mom and dad to raise these kids up into young adults of faith. He promises to hear your prayers. He promises to hear your prayers. Whether the prayer is late at night when you're like, where are the kids? They should be home by now. Or whether the prayer is early in the morning, be with my child, watch over them. All of these things, he promises to hear the prayers. He promises to be in his church and to work through his church as you create those relationships. He promises to forgive you. He promises to forgive you. I know as a parent myself, there are moments that I look back and I'm like, I blew that one. We need forgiveness too. Right? And he does. Moms, he forgives you. Dads, he forgives you. Right? And then he continues to work through you. He promises to forgive you, to restore you, to give you strength, to shelter you in, with his mighty arm. He promises to raise you up on eagle's wings, to give you strength in those moments of despair and difficulty. So don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Because God is with you, and he will answer those prayers. Amen? Amen.